I'm gonna, here we go. Here is what 30 pounds of homemade explosive looks like. At the age of 24, US Marine John Peck's life changed forever. Went to go turn around with my right foot and I'm being blown through the air. I was saying in my head, I don't wanna die here, I don't wanna die here. Catastrophically injured in Afghanistan, he woke up two months later to find his life would never be the same again. My mom had to tell me that I lost my arms and legs because I still felt them. Helpless and battling to come to terms with his situation, his world fell apart. I came up with an actual plan to commit suicide or roll my wheelchair down a flight of stairs and hopefully break my neck. But after discovering a revolutionary new surgery and with the determination to survive, John did something extraordinary. This dude is gonna get his arms back. He became one of only six quadruple amputees in America to undergo a bilateral arm transplant. The level of his amputations definitely makes his case challenging. She put her head against mine because I was like, don't let me die. John's progress has been a battle, but determined to fulfill the promises he made the donor's family, he pushed himself further. He is exceptional in every which way you could be as a human. Left fighting for his life and overcoming incredible odds, John now faces his biggest battle yet. Whenever we transplant limbs, our hope is that those limbs are gonna last forever. But we actually don't know. Does it bother me that at some point during my life I might get my arms re-amputated? Yeah. I did not know what I wanted to be when I was growing up. It was either police, firefighter, chef was in there at one point when I was 12. Yeah, that was all over the place. With a lack of direction and young adulthood fast approaching, John took a step down an unlikely path. At first, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And the first thing I went to was Air Force. And uh, they told me I was too tall, so I was like, bye, and I left. The next one was the Navy. And we we're sitting outside of his office, the Navy recruiter, and uh, didn't show up on time. The Marine recruiter was right next door. We started talking about what I want to do and kind of just went from there. Signed up for the Marines. I kind of felt like this was like my first step in the right direction, kind of changing my life around, doing something for the good. It wasn't like I was like gun ho about it, but I was excited be able to do this. In 2005, John began recruit training for the United States Marine Corps. You know, I was a six foot one tall dude. I was very excited. And that's our going away party with the Playboy bunnies. How would you describe yourself back then? I mean, I'm standing next to Playboy bunny, so all the confidence in the world. Drinking, women. Typical United States Marine. In 2007, John was sent on his first tour of duty to Al Anbar, northern Iraq. Right there. That's me. My big goofy self. You gotta understand, infantry marines were kind of insane in the membrane. We are definitely not all the way there most of the time. I wanted to make sure my junior marine had the proper equipment on at the time. I had to make sure his stuff was working. <laughs> I know it wasn't probably the best thing to do, but it was fun. Did you look back on your time in the Marines with, like, for fondness? Oh, yeah. Marines were my buddies. Marines were my friends. Marines were uh, my brothers, and kind of good times and bad times. Two years after returning from Iraq, John's unit was sent on its next tour of duty to Helmand Province, Afghanistan. We were conducting a dismounted patrol. I decided to be the one up front doing the minesweeper. I picked it. Why did you pick that? Because uh, I thought I was more experienced finding IEDs. <laughs> Apparently I am. They were tasked with winning the hearts and minds of each village they came to. 
whilst searching compounds for insurgent fighters. We knocked on each gate, and if there was nobody there, we had to get permission to enter. Thankfully, all the, all the houses we came to had people inside them. We just kind of said, hey, you know, we're here to help you. Please let us know if there's anything that we can do for you or anything like that. We need him to unlock the shop. The last compound they came to appeared to be deserted. I go in, because I'm the first person with the minesweeper. Two of my guys, they found battery and loose wires. There was nobody even around this house, which is a very bad sign. So we started to do a more thorough sweep. Next thing I know, went to go turn around with my right foot, and I'm being blown through the air. Sergeant Mendez starts calling out names. Everyone's responding. Eventually he gets to my name, he's like, Peck, and I don't respond. Eventually they hear from this hole in the ground. John had triggered a pressure plate on an improvised explosive device and sustained catastrophic injuries from the blast. Right away, they see my right leg is amputated, my left leg is amputated, right arm's amputated above the elbow, and left arm is what's called a degloving incident where the skin's pulled off the flesh. With John's patrol desperately trying to save his life, a helicopter was called in for an evacuation. I can feel the rotor wash hitting me. And next thing I know, I'm being put on the helicopter. I keep blacking in and out of consciousness. I thought I was saying in my head, I don't want to die here, I don't want to die here. Apparently, I'm saying this out loud, but it's a lot more graphic. And next thing I know, I'm waking up two and a half months later in Walter Reed. John was kept medically sedated for over two months, completely unaware of his injuries. And that was, that's me, heavily sedated, super sedated. This one doctor told me, he's like, when you came in, you were screaming at us saying, let you die, let you die. I think the very first few memories I had was like, there was a blanket on me and I couldn't move. And when I say I couldn't move, I could not move any part of me. My mom had to tell me that I lost my arms and legs because I still felt them. After losing both arms and both legs to an explosion in Afghanistan, Marine Sergeant John Peck had been medically sedated for over two months. A lot of people that cared for me when I was on my travels, I say travels like I was taking a vacation. One of the nurses messaged me and she's like, hey, I'm so glad you're alive. I'm like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, you died. You were actually dead, like dead, dead, not coming back. Despite the best efforts of the medical teams, John's injuries appeared to be too severe to survive. At one point, I actually like flatlined and the doctors were, you know, kind of like, time of death. My arms are all wrapped up in these bandages. To add to the seriousness of John's situation, doctors discovered he'd contracted a life-threatening, flesh-eating fungus. I did have a left leg. It ate my left leg all the way up to the hip. Uh, it also ate my first layer, my abdominal muscle, my fasciitis, and then it also ate my left bicep. I had to keep going back in and cutting my left leg because of the fungus. They were trying to cut it out of my system. In addition to his injuries, John also had to contend with the collapse of his 18-month marriage, leaving him isolated and alone. I just became secluded. Um, I stopped going to therapy. I said every swear word in my dictionary, and I just started going down my little dark spot. 
I came up with an actual plan to commit suicide. A guy without arms and legs trying to come up with a plan. That was great. That's when my creativity comes into play. I was going to open up a door to the stairwell, throw myself down a flight, or roll my wheelchair down a flight of stairs, and hopefully either I would die from the stairs or the wheelchair would fall on me and break my neck. One of those days, I got back from therapy. I asked to be placed at the window of my hospital room and uh, close the door. And there was a guy sitting on a bench, and he was looking towards Georgia Avenue, where the main road is. And he got up, and he was missing two or three limbs. I couldn't tell. And uh, he got up, started walking towards traffic. I thought he was going to go throw himself in traffic. And uh, this little girl comes up, grabs his hand. And I was like, oh. I'm like, he can, you know, he has a kid. Next thing I know, wife comes up, or wife, girlfriend, whatever, comes up. And um, I was like, oh, this double or triple amputee can find love. I was like, why can't I? So within the next week, I, um, I start going down to therapy. And instead of it being conversations about like me trying to commit suicide or me saying, screw you, screw this, it's more of like, I actually asked my therapist, Kyla, at the time, like, how are you doing? Like actual being conversation or having a conversation. Like I really did not want to die determined not to be beaten. Like fellow veterans, he began the arduous road to rehabilitation. I think you can stop now. That's 200, by the way. Over six months, John progressed through different levels of prosthetic limbs until he was eventually able to walk again. Uh, ah! It was a demanding and full-time occupation, leaving John detached and fatigued. If the internet wasn't around, I don't think I would be alive. The internet definitely helped. It was like, well, not just the internet. Social media was definitely the driving force. Oh, hey, morning, afternoon. Evening, I guess it depends on where you are in the world. The internet allowed John to reach out to the outside world and break his isolation. So here we go. Here's how I play Clash of Clans for all of you weird people out there. As John's followers grew, so did the messages of support and appreciation, prompting John to start a page documenting his journey. I hope that everyone will join us tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern for a live Q&A on the John Pack Journey Facebook site. Please share. Sharing his progress online not only helped John connect with the world again, but it also inspired others. The reason why I keep the Journey site going is because hopefully it'll help somebody who's kind of down in the dumps or depressed. Now John's following has grown to over 15,000 people. Just the other day, there was a guy who used to be a cop and he sent me a message and he's like you dude like I don't think you understand like you keep me going but he's like paralyzed and stuff like that so like I know it I know it helps people if the 200 people that have watched this and one person's an amputee and they get answers that's all I care about while John was helping others he was also struggling with his own mobility with prosthetics, life wasn't perfect. I still needed help, plus wearing a prosthetic all the time kind of bruised up my left arm. One day, whilst researching treatments, John stumbled across news of a man in Spain who received a double leg transplant. I got on my computer and I was looking for this guy in Spain, so I typed in double leg transplant or leg transplant. It immediately came up with Brigham and Women's. Brigham and Women's in Boston is one of only a few hospitals in the world to carry out this groundbreaking new procedure. VCA, vascularized composite allotransplantation, or what we think of as hand transplantation, or transplantation of, of body parts, is a type of surgery that's come to bear over the last probably 15, 20 years, whereby we can take a part of a body from a deceased donor and transfer it to somebody who's living and needs that body part. The hospital has only carried out four of these procedures since starting in 2011. John approached us, he called us by phone um, to see what we were doing. 
We talk to patients about you know, what's involved and make sure they understand all of the details of what they're getting themselves into. John was invited to Boston to undertake an extensive round of mental and physical assessments. Transplant's not for everybody. Transplant's for a small group of patients who really understand what they're going through and are willing to undertake the risks in order to get some of the really profound benefits. After months of assessments, the doctors had come to a decision. They finally sat me down. And they're like, hey, look, we can't do your left leg. There's nothing there to attach. We can do your right leg. But how about the arms first? All right, so today is August 27th, 2014, Wednesday, and officially 11.06 a.m. This dude, Sergeant John Peck, what, what? Just got listed for a double arm transplant. I think um, mental and physical resilience go really strongly together, um, and John's background in the military gives him actually both. This dude is gonna get his arms back. So for that first week, I did not leave my phone at all. While I was on that waiting list, like the phone was like glued to my side. Every time I'd come up with Boston, Massachusetts number, I'm like, oh my God, is this it? Is this it? And it'd just be like the case manager, Elaine, would be like, hi, John. He, I'm like, yeah. She like, this is Elaine, the case manager. I just wanted to see if you still want to be a candidate. I'd be like, oh, Elaine. Um, it was frustrating. John found a distraction while waiting for news of a donor match. He joined a dating website and met someone. Apparently just saw my profile and she found it extremely sweet. Like the, and then also very funny. Like there were things in there like, you know, I'm a blast to be around. And then there was just like sweet things that were like, hey, by the way, I'm not here for, you know, games. I came across his profile one night and it was really funny and I don't laugh out loud when I read things and I kept laughing. He's like the opposite of my type. <laughs> John's the opposite of my type. I dated somebody who was like on paper my exact type and I was terrible. <laughs> and I went to the anti-Jessica type, which is John, who's <laughs> a total goofball, and that's the one that worked out. In spite of John's physical limitations, they were both determined not to let that hold back their flourishing romance. You know, Jess did have to help me with like uh, driving, like she did have to drive us to the dates and everything like that. Did have to help me get dressed and a few other minor things here and there, but it wasn't like, babe, help me do this, help me do this, help me do this. Five months of dating, we built a strong foundation. But for the new couple, things were about to change. It was right about four o'clock-ish. And I looked down at my phone and it comes up with this weird name and it says doctor, but then it comes up with like, almost like an Indian name. I cannot pronounce it, I can't even remember what it was and it said Boston, Massachusetts. I'm like, this is it. And I knew that this was it because I was not expecting a call. I answer the phone and it's Dr. Talbot. He's like, John, I'm like, yep, that's me. He's like, so we think we have a match. I kind of like lay on the couch and I start break down crying because I'm happy, but my mood switches and I start to like actually cry for the person who just died. I felt bad for him and I felt bad for his family. Even though I've never, I don't, I didn't know their names. I didn't know anything about them. I just felt bad for somebody out there that I never met because they're, they're willing to donate their son or their husband, their boyfriend's arms. And that's all I knew. That's all I knew at that current time. Within 24 hours of the phone call, John was in Boston, ready for surgery. The transplant will begin by joining John's bones to the donor arms using metal plates. Next, Dr. Talbot and his team use microscopes and precision instruments to connect John's arteries and veins. When blood starts flowing, John's new hand should turn pink with new life. 
They then repair the muscles and tendons before finally connecting John's nerves to the donor arms. Hopefully, in time, giving him sensation and function. The level of his amputations um, definitely makes his case a little bit more challenging than others. The worst case scenario, you know, there's a potential with this degree of surgery and this degree of medical intervention that someone can die from this. I, I don't know, something in my brain was like marine time, like no emotion, stone face. I was fine. For John's loved ones, it was a bittersweet moment. I didn't want him to do the transplant at all. It's not that I didn't support him doing the transplant. I didn't think it was worth the risk because he could have died during the surgery. It was his choice to do the transplant. I stood by him. It was just more like, I don't think it's worth you dying for. You can't do an operation that's of this magnitude without having some complications along the way. I pretty much kept it together until they actually took him into pre-op. When he went around the corner, I lost it. Apparently, when I turned the corner, she actually like broke down like crying, and she couldn't remember who was holding her or anything. And that's actually kind of when I started breaking down, too. I got to the actual operating table. There was this one nurse, and she put her head against mine, because I was like, don't let me die on this table. With preparation and testing complete, John is finally sedated for surgery to begin. I was in surgery 16 hours total. It was a long day. Well, not for me, for Jess it was. Two surgical teams were required to transplant each arm simultaneously. John's transplant had somewhere between 10 and 20 people in the operating room. Now, about half of those people are surgeons, and the other group are all of the people that make it possible what we do in the operating room. With tissue in the donor arms deteriorating with every minute that passes, a delay in the procedure could result in the transplant failing. That part was scary, and I didn't sleep the whole time he had the surgery, but somebody was in the operating room every two hours, they would send me an update. That helped because with it being that extensive of a time period that somebody's under, um, it just helped. Everything's still okay, everything's, <laughs> we move on to this part, I think. After 16 long hours, the 20 strong team have completed John's groundbreaking arm transplant. All they can do now is wait for John to come round from the anesthesia. Initial signs were good. My voice hurts. I'm a real boy. I'm a real boy. Give everybody a thumbs up. There's no thumbs up. 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 But as the drugs wore off, things began to change. All that stuff that was blocking the pain from my body was starting to wear off. And the pain got so bad that I was literally seconds away from paging the nurse and saying, hey, I need you to call the team and amputate my arms again. It was so bad that first night. I, seconds away, and I started thinking about my donor. I was like, I can't, I can't like go through all this. And then donor died and, um, and then just have my arms amputated just because of a little pain. Like I've handled worse, like I can do this. I think that the view of the public when it comes to hand transplantation is that this is a huge operation and certainly can have a lot of things go wrong, but that the operation is the end of the story. Really, the operation is the beginning of the story for these patients. People think that you attach the arms and it's like, oh, bam, you got your fingers back. You can go do whatever you want. Like, you're going to go use them like how you used to use your hands. No. Within days of receiving new arms, John began intense physiotherapy from a dedicated team of specialists. We're asking a lot of these patients. We're asking them to 
risk some of their well-being having a major operation and we're asking them to go through rehabilitation which is daily at the beginning. It's an enormous ask of anybody to actually go through that kind of process. And he... The person undergoing the transplant isn't the only person who has to adjust. The caregiver and the family members for these patients are unbelievably important. Oh. When he first had the transplant done, we couldn't really be apart more than, I don't know, 15 minutes. Couldn't drink anything, couldn't scratch your nose, couldn't put pressure on, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't eat, couldn't go to the bathroom. Yeah. She had never, ever helped me with more personal things I would never ask a girlfriend to do, like toy going to the bathroom. Number two, couldn't do that. The family member of a transplant patient is a critical part of success. There's no question that going through this without that person would be nearly impossible. Jess's commitment and John's determination started to show results. Get them fingers moving. Very first time my fingers wiggled. That was December 28th, 2016. So that was um, three months after transplant. <laughs> was that a huge day for you, John? Oh, yeah. I mean, you could see the smile. <laughs> when you don't have anything, just a little bit of function is incredible. Make a fist. I couldn't trim my nails at the time. Oh. When you get an arm transplant, it's not guaranteed to work. It's not. It really isn't. When the fingers wiggled like that, it was a good sign that things could possibly potentially work out. A good thing. Over the next 12 months, John worked daily to increase strength and control. It's hard for us to understand just what it's like to completely devote your life to something like getting back your limbs that five years earlier you had. Rookie. John shared his achievements online with his growing social media following. These are your first push-ups. Mm, these are my first push-ups without a yoga ball. In true marine spirit, John started to get a little competitive. Brandon Morocco, he was the very first quad from the Iraq-Afghan war. He was doing pull-ups at 18 months, and I wanted to do pull-ups before him. John's now making huge strides. He's far, far further forward than I had anticipated. I mean, that's extraordinary that somebody can get to that point this early on. His newly found strength also translated into day-to-day -day skills, affording him more independence and freedom. At first, I couldn't brush my teeth. It took me like almost a year to be able to do it. You know, it was always like, hey, babe, hey, babe, can you do this, can you do this? I just felt bad because I was asking her for everything. I mean, Jess can go away for like a weekend and I'd be perfectly fine by myself. Ow, I just stabbed myself in the eye with the brazzle. <laughs> I feel like I still have more to do. I still can progress further and further. It's just all about like strength in the hands. My main challenge is at the moment, like, you know, believe it or not, it's like holding certain items, um, like a bottle, um, picking up like burgers, believe it or not, it's kind of hard. Opening this lid, it's kind of hard. I'm not gonna get frustrated at it. I'm not gonna Hulk smash it. I use my teeth for a lot of things, as you see. <laughs> Hair gel, tastes good, yum. <laughs> it's not strong enough to like, for instance, like right there, I wasn't really wasn't really like squeezing it out. It was more of like gravity was helping me. It's all about like uh, using the hands more and increasing my strength. 
I got any big globs of hair gel in my hair? <laughs> well, yeah, you got a tiny one here. Right here? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. John's limbs are working well, but there's another advantage to a transplant over prosthetics, sensation. When people have a hand transplant, outsiders, people who have not had a hand transplant, we tend to focus on the motor function, on the fact that now I can pick up a glass of water and drink. We tend to forget a little bit about how important sensory feedback is, how touching a person is a connection to that person, or how holding your food is a connection to what you're eating. And those are the things that we, we often forget about when we're talking to patients about how, how they'll feel after having had a transplant. It's going to be in a bag. There's hope that John's sensation will improve as the nerves grow down the donor arms at a rate of one inch per month. Until that happens, the arms are vulnerable to injury. We were at Whole Foods, and I put my arm, my right arm, up against the cabinet, and there was a steamer tray, a stainless steel uh, steamer tray, and I actually burned myself, and it's because I couldn't feel that I was burning myself. So when we got home, we took off my sweater and it was a big old blister by the time we were done. Although the kitchen involves risks, cooking is still one of John's greatest passions. Yeah, my hands are starting to get sore. It gets hard to kind of stir. That's why I need Jess. Jess helps me out. John's attending one of his regular occupational therapy sessions to see just how well his sensory function is improving. Hey, how you doing? All right, any numbness, tingling? No. Lots of sensation, increased sensation, holding something hot, something cold? Right now, yeah, because my hands are frozen. Yeah. Let me know if you feel one or two. Two. Right now, we're testing the um, sensation here. So we're using this device to see how he can discriminate between one point of contact versus two points of contact. One or two? Uh, one. <laughs> I didn't even touch you. <laughs> I have one other patient who came in one day and he said, you know, for the first time in years, he felt a raindrop on his hand. Now to you and me, that's not a huge big deal. But to somebody who hasn't felt that for years, that's, you know, that's a real emotional thing. Ow. That's two. Okay. The nature of John's original <laughs> amputation has a major impact on the success of rehabilitation. The higher up your amputation is, the further the nerves have to grow. The longer it takes for those nerves to grow into the hand, the poorer his function will be. One, two, three, four. This is working on his sensory discrimination and trying to find the difference between the small beads and the poker chips. Yeah, I can't feel it. Can you feel it? Can't tell the difference. Come up. Yeah, couldn't feel it. Yeah. I can feel the tiny beads, but I can't feel, feel the Feel the difference chip. between the poker chips and the beads. Yeah. So flex John will continue to gain feeling, nice. but there are no guarantees that he'll ever reach a full range of sensation. Good. When I went up to Brigham for the initial testing for the arm transplant, they told me, you'll never be able to feel the difference between, like on a TV remote, like the difference between the one and two button. Because, it, because it's, that, it, it's that close to each other, I wouldn't be able to tell which button I have. I was like, so wait, you're telling me I can hold a remote, though? <laughs> My goal is to give somebody function that allows them to do basic everyday activities. Hygiene, cooking in the kitchen, driving a car, things that you and I take for granted, but for somebody without hands is incredibly disabling. The extra tag that we have, is it just for the front door or is it for the elevator as well? Thanks to a fully adapted car, John is now able to drive totally independently. I know as I use them more, my strength will start to increase, which means I could do more, like driving. I've always been independent. Although life is improving, there's still one key concern hanging over John, rejection. Rejection is when um, the patient's body attacks the part that we've transplanted. So when their immune system uh, tries to fight off the transplanted limb. So it's morning. 
Four of those are immune suppression. One of those is a steroid. One of those is a antiviral. We always have to be dampening down someone's immune system so that their own body doesn't attack the hands that we've transplanted. And you have to take those every day of your life? Every morning. For? Ever. Forever. Immunosuppression is, um, is a two-edged sword. All of our patients need immunosuppression so that they don't reject the limbs that we've put on. But at the same time, that immunosuppression weakens their immune system. And weakening your immune system means that you're susceptible to just routine everyday infections like colds, uh, but also to more serious infections and also to things like cancer. And so um, it's not trivial that we put patients on immunosuppression, but we need to do it. And that's part and parcel with having a transplant. You can't just kind of sugarcoat this. You can't sugarcoat and be like, oh, things may not happen. I'll never have rejection, blah, blah, blah. Like, you're gonna have rejection no matter what you do. You're gonna have good days, you're gonna have bad days. It's, it's, yeah, it's just stuff that you have to be aware of. I mean, does it bother me that at some point during my life I might get my arms reamputated? Yeah. John's body is fighting his new arms. And with the visible appearance of skin lesions, it appears to be his worst bout of rejection to date. Looks worse. Yeah, it's look pretty bad over there. I have a great team, and they know what they're doing. It's just this particular rejection episode. They're kind of like scratching their heads. And that's new, here, correct? This is that new. appears no, to be this a little drier. New. This isn't new. This rejection has been ongoing for a long time. In normal rejection, the it's your immune system's too strong, and it's fighting the foreign material. So they put you on a steroid to knock down your immune system. But his immune system is very, very, very low, so they can't knock his immune system out anymore. It almost looks like there's damn pimples inside of them. If you get close, there's yeah, like I see them. all these like little pimples. Same here. Yeah. Well, those three. All right. Whenever we transplant limbs, our hope is that those limbs are going to last forever. But we actually don't know. We know that they can last 20 years. We don't know if they can make it through 30 and 40 years. It's two issues. He's having rejection, but he's also having an immune problem. I'm still worried now today. Like, it's still kind of a big deal. Like, there's a chance that it could not work, and I'll just have to go back to being a quad amputee without an arm transplant. But with his body's immunity levels at an all-time low, there's much more at stake for John. If you don't have an immune system, and if, say, they did have to reamputate, he wouldn't make the surgery. Despite the ongoing risk of rejection, John's not putting his life on hold. I think my hardest battles have been fought and won. I think accepting my quad amputation, accepting what happened to me, going through the arm transplant, and I think finding love are probably the four hardest battles. The rest is just kind of like a cakewalk for me. We just have to deal with it one day at a time. Boop. John's attitude towards the person who planted the IED has changed since the incident. There is a little bit of hatred towards him. But I've let go of that hatred and everything, and now I feel like I'm actually here for a reason. Off the back of the success of his social media profile, he's decided to publish a book about his journey so far in the hope that he'll inspire others. OK, so this is from the people today. We are looking forward to this afternoon with you and Jessica. I had a couple of quick thoughts. I will introduce you to the team and would suggest that you then spend some time just sharing your story from the beginning. In addition to the book, John is also hoping to take up public speaking. Are you a natural um, speaker, John, would you say? No. In high school, I absolutely hated getting in front of the crowd, in front of the class. I still do. I still get very anxious. I think that's a good thing, though. It means that you're not you're not overconfident. John is meeting with executives from an agency that represents politicians, business leaders, and top military figures in the hope 
they'll represent him. That's why I see him. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling anxious about this meeting? Jim? No. Now I am. Thanks. <laughs> no. Nope. I just gotta be myself. Stop with the sweaty hands. Take your sweaty hands and your sweaty pants away from me. Stop. Ow! That hurt. You stabbed me with those nails. You ready to get started? Let's do this. All right. I feel like I'm here for a reason. I feel like there's a bigger purpose for me to be here, to help somebody through a tough time, or help somebody get educated on the arm transplant. Yeah, so I just feel like there's a bigger purpose. You, I'm gonna forget probably all your names. I became aware of John seven years ago and have been told by people ever since then who knew what I did for a living that I needed to, to meet him. We entered a compound and everything was fine. Went up to the individual rooms, got as close as I can. I took a sidestep to my right. Next thing I know, I'm being flung through the air. It's uncomfortable for people to talk about themselves, especially when it's something so traumatic. Immediately, my right arm was amputated. My right leg was amputated. I flatlined about twice. And then I caught a fleshy fungus that ate my left bicep and it also ate my left leg all the way up to the hip. He's not somebody that's a household name yet. And so in order for that to work, people are gonna have to start to become aware of his story. I got on the arm transplant waiting list on August 28th of 2014. When I first woke up, my arms were basically like, like this up higher than my head. And I started screaming at her because I was like, they gave me baby arms. <laughs> I thought he did a great job today. John is unique for sure. He is exceptional in every which way you could be as a human. I'm not here for fame. I'm not here for monetary reasons. The reason we decided to go through the book is because there's people who have said like, dude, like I almost committed suicide. Like, you have your story of what you've been through has helped me out. The challenge for him is going to be to figure out what of his story is the most relevant to each particular audience. But I think he's going to get good at it. I really, really think he's going to get good at it. I think it went well. Daniel said, like, I need to figure out a way to basically telling that within 15 minutes. I think that's probably the hardest, going to be the hardest part. Your ear. I know. She's like, babe, too much detail. Just get to it. Just get to the story. John's plans for a new career are likely to raise his profile and the public's interest in his story. Do you see yourself as, you know, say that you're a hero, do you see yourself as a hero? Mm -mm. I don't use that term. And I hate when people call me that. I absolutely hate that term. It's like, don't ever call me a hero. Like, what makes me a hero? Because I stepped on an IED? Like, no, that doesn't make me a hero. My definition of hero is somebody who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And that doesn't mean just military, that's first responders, cops, anybody that's hurt in the line of duty. Like, those are heroes, not me. I stepped on an IED. I stepped on, well, stepped on one, rolled on another one. That doesn't mean I'm a hero. That just means I'm good at finding IEDs in the worst way possible. <laughs> but not everyone shares John's opinion. You know, John is a, an incredible success story. John went from having a profound disability to someone who can now be relatively independent and take care of himself independently. And I think by itself, that is an incredible success. John's come a long way since the surgery two years ago but now he can look forward to an independent life, thanks to the generosity of one total stranger. What do you feel when you look down your arms? I feel compassion. I feel respect and love, and I feel, yeah, just all those, because without his family's, without his family's donation, I wouldn't be here. <laughs>